different than expected up here on stage. Um, there's been a quite a saga over the past 24 hours. Um, perhaps Director Easterly will share a little bit from, from her perspective. Um, but suffice it to say, not for lack of trying, uh, she couldn't quite make it to Omaha today. Um, but uh, at, even when the travel didn't work out, um, she really wanted to connect with us and interact with Colonel Khan and the, and the hacker community. So she's here dedicating her time uh, virtually. And the setup we have here will allow um, folks to ask questions directly. So we have the mic set up here. Um, if you uh, want to queue up when you have a question, we'll more or less go in the order of the queue. Um, so we'll do a little bit of fireside chat here. Um, it will be um, uh, as fluid as, as we can make it. We've done some practice with the tech and we, we think it'll, you know, we're making a little bit of lemonade here. Um, so we do wanna, she does wanna take questions and interact directly with you. So please have them ready up at the microphone. And um, you know, this is, this is Colonel Khan in interesting times and we're hackers and we adapt. So in, in 2020, we adapted in two weeks to virtual. In 2021, we tried to do something different because all the virtual conferences kind of felt the same. And um, this is, you know, right now, this is the twist that happened this morning. So um, I've said a lot. Um, Director Easterly, do you have any um, opening comments that you wanted to share? Some opening comments that you hey, wanted Tim. to share? Hey, everybody. Uh, just glad to be here. Uh, the, uh uh the conditions uh were against us sadly yesterday as we thought um we were going to be able to get out of dc but um flights got canceled these things happened and as you say uh we adapt and overcome so i appreciate the opportunity to be with you all well great uh we're, we're happy to have you and um you know i I presume that everybody knows a little bit about Director Easterly and who she is, and rather than sort of read a long bio, we thought we'd kind of try and um, go back and forth and uh, sort of extract a little bit of information. So um, I'd like to start with saying something like, you know, Director of CISA is not a small job. I don't know what your budget is. I'll probably go look it up. It's something like three and a half billion dollars or something like that. But um, do you have uh, life hacks or morning routines or, or anything like that that you can share about um, how you stay ahead of the game? Yeah, you know, at the end of the day, I think figuring out how to prioritize what you have going on in your life is probably the most important lesson that I've learned after 30 some years um, of working. Uh, if everything's a priority, then nothing's a priority. And one of the things that has become a bigger priority for me as I've gotten older are, is health. Uh, I wasn't that good at that. You know, I grew up in the Army, 22 years in the Army, where, you know, everybody is cold, cold wet, tired, and hungry most of the time. Uh, I deployed to Iraq. I was in Afghanistan, Haiti, Bosnia, Kosovo, uh, where you end up working pretty intensely. And oftentimes what, uh, what gets deprioritized is your physical health, your mental health, uh, how you eat, uh, how you exercise, and a lot of times the, the times you spend with your family. And so as I've gotten older, the thing that I have become more deliberate about is getting more sleep. I used to be a four and a half hour sleep person. Um, now I'm much closer to six or seven hours because I think when you have so much stuff going on, you really have to be sharp. You have to be on your game. Um, and it's really hard to do that when you're exhausted and sleep deprived. Um, try and eat well. Uh, that's not always the, uh, uh, it's not always uh, what I'm able to do. I'm a big fan of um, cheeseburgers and things like that. So, but I do my best. Uh, and, you know, spending time, I've got a 17-year-old boy. And so the one silver lining about not making it out to uh, Omaha to hang out with you and everybody was I got to go see him playing a concert last night. So that was actually really cool. And I got to meet his girlfriend, which was like a total bonus, I have to say. So um, so that was actually very cool. So if there was a good reason to miss, uh, to miss being there in person, it was the uh, uh, getting to do that. Yeah, it's always good to try and find this the silver lining or the good perspective, right? Um, uh, do we have any other people in the audience who are like four hours of sleep kind of people? <laughs> I feel like this might be a common trend here. No? Okay, it's it's only maybe a sixth, less than I thought. 
Um, so, uh, a very open-ended question. I don't know if, if anybody's looked around, but we have Rubik's Cubes uh, as, a, as a giveaway um, at the conference here. And um, so, why Rubik's Cubes? Like, where did that come from? Why is that a part of your, your bio picture? Oh, yeah. Can you see the ones? I have a whole collection back there. I don't know if people can see them. And I always have my Sissa Cube with me. Um, people come visit me. We can get some. I don't know which ones you were giving out. Are you giving out the speed cubes? Because those are really the, the best ones. So you committed to uh, speaking with us too late for us to get speed cubes. So we have, I actually tried really hard, but uh, we have uh, official Rubik's uh, brand cubes, which are not as good, even though they're the official ones, as I'm sure you know. <laughs> Um, cool. Well, I'll make sure you get some system cubes, Jen. Um, yeah, when I was a little kid, I was a bit of, um, it's kind of a nerd, but I loved games of all sort. I was huge into video games, and, you know, this was the early days when I was really young, things like Atari, if you remember, you know, Pitfall Pete and all those fun things, and then all the arcades, I did a ton of that. Um, and I just loved puzzles. Uh, and so, you know, the Rubik's Cube was invented by uh, a Hungarian professor of uh, architecture called Erno Rubik, and I think he invented it in the early 70s, but it didn't actually get released globally until 1980 when I was 11. And so, you know, I thought it was fantastic, so got one, figured out how to solve it, and then what I would do, uh, we would travel around um, with my parents to go to toy stores, and I would bet the toy store owner or the clerk, hey, if I can solve this thing, and I think it was back then, it was like less than two minutes, will you give me a free one? And, you know, back then, they, these were just getting introduced to the world, and so, you know, everyone thought, hey, it's really hard to do, so everyone was impressed with two minutes. Now you go on YouTube, and you can see like a baby solving the Rubik's Cube with their toes in 11.7 seconds. So like two minutes ain't so good, but um, uh, so I just, I just loved it. And I had a whole huge collection of Rubik's Cubes and it was super fun. But you know, it's really, to me, it's kind of a metaphor for um, how to put together your life. You know, there's a lot of things in our lives that are really, really difficult to solve. Um, but if you are determined, um, if you work really hard, uh, if you keep an open mind about um, the various patterns that are out there and um, continue to, you know, you'll fail a lot, but if you are persistent, um, you can solve the puzzle. And so I think in many ways it also is emblematic of the ethos of people that we're looking to bring here to CISA. You know, we're the newest agency in the federal government. There's probably a lot of people out in the audience that hasn't heard of us. Why? Because, you know, we're not 100 years old like the Federal Bureau of Investigation or 75 years old like the National Security Agency. But we were created by Congress in 2018 to be America's cyber defense agency because they realize there's this huge gap. And so we are about 5,000 people. We have a $2.6 billion budget that's likely growing. Um, and we are looking to bring in fantastic people who love to solve problems um, and love to take on technical challenges. And you know, the Rubik's Cube is sort of solving it on your own. It's kind of an individual thing, but what we're also really looking for are great team players who understand um, how to bring together teams to be able to solve the most technical, technically challenging uh, problems for the defense of the nation. Yeah, uh, we'll probably pull that on that thread here, here in a minute, but um, you said something, um, I don't know, a few sentences ago that, that made me wonder, you know, you were at the White House a couple of times, you were the, the senior director for counterterrorism, and then you went private, right, with Morgan Stanley. Um, what drew you back to um, government service, like public service, right? <laughs> Well, I know it's been in your DNA at the end of the day. My dad uh, was a high school dropout. Um, he was um, adopted and like really um, badly physically abused by his stepdad. And so he like, basically dropped out, went and enlisted in the army and ended up in Vietnam um, in the early days of the conflict. Um, and it had a real impact on him in a really positive way. And that always had an impact on me. I knew I wanted to serve. Uh, ended up going to West Point. 
it was the early days where women were at West Point, so 10 years in, um, after women were admitted in 1976. And I got there in July of 1986, and there were still a lot of, a lot of men, uh, students and professors who didn't want women there. But, you know, so that was a whole other experience we can chat about. Um, but it really taught me the power of resilience, frankly, and that, you know, I could uh, overcome a lot of big challenges, both personal and professional. Um, it, it really, you know, service to nation. It really gets into your blood frankly, and you certainly don't get paid a lot of money serving in government, but you get a sense of mission and a sense of purpose that you really can't get in the private sector. And so I loved my time at Morgan Stanley. Uh, I loved the team there, loved the mission, got to stand up our cyber fusion center, was the head of resilience there, um, and you know, lived up in New York City, which I love as well. Uh, but when you have that calling, when the president asks you to serve again, and particularly in a mission as important as the cyber defense of the nation, I felt it was important to to um, to come back to serve again. But you know, like everything else, it wasn't a decision I made alone. It was something that I made with my family because the reason I left government, you know, and I was the head of counterterrorism at the White House, it was a super stressful time, right? It was 2013 to 2016. It was the uh, ISIS um, attacks around the globe. It was the hostage crisis that uh, I was in charge of managing in terms of the new policy. And I lived down at the White House, you know, toward near in DuPont Circle, near the White House, about a mile away. My family lived up by Fort Meade. And I never saw my son really between the ages when he was nine to 12. And so I really wanted to be able to spend more time with him. And that's why one of the reasons I went off to the private sector. Most people don't go to a global investment bank to spend more time with your family, but they do if you're the head of counterterrorism at the White House. And so, um, you know, I, I sat down with my husband and my son and we kind of made a decision that we we're going to move back. And um, uh, I think it was the right thing to do. You know, I didn't really know much about DHS. I'd never served in the Department of Homeland Security before. I was in the Army. I was at NSA. I was at the White House twice. Um, helped with um, the stand-up of U.S. Cyber Command. Um, but I'd never been in DHS. I worked with Department of Homeland Security folks before. But, you know, it's fantastic. This is really the best job I've ever had, and I've had some pretty cool ones. Um, and part of it is because like, we're the startup in the U.S. government. So we have an opportunity to not be like a lumbering government bureaucracy. We can be more like a cool um, public-private collaborative that um, is focused on a attracting and retaining the best talent from around the country and solving some of the most technically challenging problems. And so it's a, really, it's a real opportunity to build something cool and different. Yeah, that's, that's a good point, and I think maybe that's a good segue into, I'm not sure if everybody is you know, intimately familiar with CISA, the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency. Um, is there anything about the, the you know, could you share a little bit about the mission that might be helpful um, for folks? I know that you're the, the operational lead for, for the government side, um, but you're also a coordinator for critical infrastructure, right? right. Yeah, totally. So. Um... So CISA was created, as I said, in 2018. It used to be a smaller staff element that was part of Department of Homeland Security, and the Congress really realized, hey, there's a major gap in terms of how we're defending the nation in cyberspace. And so they set up CISA, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. We like security so much, we had to have it twice in our name. Um, but really, you think of it as America's Cyber Defense Agency. So our, our mission is to lead the national effort to understand, manage, and reduce risk uh, to the infrastructure that underpins Americans' lives, right? How we get gas at the pump, how we get food at the grocery store, how we get money at the bank, uh, what makes our power work, how we get our waters. These are all what we think about as our critical infrastructure, and we are responsible for helping to protect and defend it. Uh, but as we know, like a lot of this infrastructure, in fact, the vast majority of this infrastructure is owned by the private sector. And so what our mission is, is to ensure that we are creating uh, strong, trusted partnerships with the private sector so we can work with them to make sure that they have the guidance and the resources that they need to be able to reduce risk to their network. So folks probably see a lot of the messages, a lot of the technical advisories that we put out 
Um, we are US CERT, we are ICS CERT. Um, I know some people are like, what happened to those, you know, that ICS CERT thing? What happened to US CERT? It just all became part of our CISA cyber division when we stood up as a separate agency. And so we still have all of that capability, all of that talent. Uh, but now we're very focused on making sure we've got the right information out, but we do incident response, we do threat hunt, uh, we do vulnerability uh, management, which is one of, I think, our most important missions with uh, academics and researchers and hackers. We just recently stood up a technical advisory council of some awesome uh, hackers from around the world under the leadership of Jeff Moss, who of course started DEF CON. Um, so we are really building building our capability, but, you know, as I said, we're sort of a startup, so um, we are doing everything we can to make sure that folks understand what we do, and, like, frankly, Tim, like, my operating principle in life is to treat feedback as a gift, um, and to not be defensive about people, like, respectfully, right, I don't, like, people shouldn't be dicks about it. Um, but at the end of the day, like if people have real feedback on the types of advisories that we're putting out or want to partner with us or have a question or want to add value to what we're doing, this has to be a mission that's about us collectively coming together, right? You can't, government can't solve this problem. The industry can't solve the problem. We have to do it together because we have some special capabilities and industry owns and operates critical infrastructure. And so... Um, you know, we have to do it with humility. We have to assume noble intent and hope that our partners do as well. Um, and we have to offer, um, we have to offer, you know, a posture that's really about how are we adding value um, and how are we working together to uh, defend the nation. That, yeah, that's a um, that's a pretty powerful thing. It's also tricky, right? There's, a, there's many facets to that. And you mentioned uh, Cyber Command, which uh, I think you had a, a role in helping create uh, Cyber Command in, in some way. Um, when you look at things like that and uh, the JCDC, uh, how do you see those roles, you know, fitting together? Like, where do the responsibilities uh, stop and where are they shared and how do they overlap? Um, and then also, like, they're not very old, right? The JCDC has not been around for very long. How's it working so far? Far. Yeah, it's a great question. Let me talk for a sec about Cybercom because it's kind of a, a cool story. Um, so, you know, Cybercom's only been around since I think officially we stood up in May of 2010. So it's been about 12 years. And um, folks will remember in the 2008 timeframe, there was this major um, intrusion on military networks. It was a really big deal at the time because it was the first time. Uh, there, there was this realization of vulnerability of military classified networks, and so it was a huge deal. And it really led to a recognition that what we were doing uh, already was not going to work, right? We really needed to build a new type of structure that would allow us to bring together military cyber defense and military cyber offensive operations, and, and we needed to do it in close part partnership with the National Security Agency, which had a lot of capability as a cryptologic platform for the U.S., so to help understand the threat um, coming from nation state actors in particular, but threats, cyber threats from overseas. And so I was the commander of the Army Cyber Battalion. I had redeployed from Iraq, and I was asked to stand at this battalion, essentially the Army's, Army's hackers. Uh, and because of that, I was asked to be part of this very small group of what we call the Cybercom implementation team, the I team. It was me, Paul Nakasoni, who's now the commander of Cybercom. He was an 06 colonel back then. I was a lieutenant colonel. Um, a dude called Tim White, who was um, a Navy captain, uh, retired as a three star. And then um, SL Davis, who was an Air Force colonel stationed in um, Stratcom out in Omaha. Uh, and he was put there to sort of be the spy. Uh, on the small team from Stratcom because there were concerns about like Cybercom standing up. And uh, as it ended up, we all became like best friends. Um, and so I just went to his promotion to three star as the Air Force Inspector General. And um, it was a great, it, it was an awesome opportunity to like literally create and design a new command. But one of the biggest takeaways from that 
um, in addition to like the power of small collaborative teams where like nobody cares what your rank is, um, they just care about how you can contribute to the mission, um, was the power of storytelling. Because, you know, cyber and what we were talking about back then, even just 12 years ago, it can be like super technical, people's eyes glaze over, like I say multi-factor authentication, and like most people like start falling asleep, right? And so you have to figure out how to tell the story in a powerful way. And so we created something called the Cyber Storyboard, where we had to brief it about 105 times, Paul, Maxoni, and I, to get people to understand why we needed to create this new command. And so I think it's so important that when you were talking to, obviously this is a very technical audience of hackers, but when we're talking to people who don't have a technical background, when you all in, the, in that audience are talking to people who don't have a technical background and trying to help them understand what they need to do to protect their businesses, to protect themselves, it's really important to be able to tell the story around that in a way that can resonate with people who are not necessarily technically um, adept. So that was a huge lesson learned. On the JCDC, thanks for asking. So the JCDC Joint Cyber Defense Collaborative um, I'm a big, I know cyberpunk is the, is the theme of Colonel Khan this year. I did post a tweet this morning about my favorite cyberpunk band, so about my favorite punk band, so folks can check that out on uh, Sis and Jen. Um, but uh, I'm a big fan of 80s music. I'm, you know, a child of the 70s and 80s, so classic rock. So I tried to call it the Advanced Cyber Defense Collaborative, but the lawyers didn't love that. So we went with um, we went with the, the Joint Cyber Defense Collaborative. But what this really, um, it, it's actually super cool because the Congress created it at the end of last year because there's no entity in the U.S government that brings together the full capabilities of the cyber ecosystem. So, you know, as you know, I went off to Morgan Stanley for four and a half years. I've been in the government for 27 years. I get to Morgan Stanley and I look back at the government and I'm like, damn, that's dysfunctional, right? It's like you have all these like things coming at you from different parts of the government. You're not sure what you should be paying attention to. Some of the stuff doesn't make sense. It's like, what you know what's going on and so i just thought it was kind of jacked and it's one of the reasons why i wanted to come back into government to make sure that we were much more coherent in how we were approaching the private sector and you didn't have to have like a phd in government studies to figure out who to go to and that's really why congress created CISAs to be that front door and JCDC is it's a platform, but you know, SIS is there, but we also bring in NSA and FBI and Cybercom and Secret Service and DOD and DOJ. So we bring everybody into one platform. So if you come to JCDC, you can actually tap into FBI and NSA um, cyber defense capabilities. So it's, it's the whole idea of bringing together the full force of the federal cyber ecosystem in one platform with the private sector. So I did, I launched it when I keynoted um, Black Hat last year. And so that was in August. We started setting it up in earnest in September. And we have seen a lot of success from it in terms of bringing together the U.S. government and the private sector both to deal with log for show of course, the very serious vulnerability that was revealed in December and now working through potential threats from the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And at the end of the day, I mean, my key message to you and to everybody in the audience is, look, I realized through 30 plus years um, of you know, working in government, working in the private sector, um, that at the end of the day, like the most important thing to forge a partner is in marriage or what is still a relationship with the government. So we're working really hard to make sure that we, um, the business community, whether it's the hacker community, the researcher community, the the community because I firmly believe like everybody contributes to what we need to do out there, nation states, cyber criminals, you guys know the deal and all of it. And so from the JCDC government to understand 
threat environment and then to implement cyber defense operations together. And so happy to go in a little more detail on that, but you know, just think of it as the center of gravity for cyber defense for the U.S. government and the front door for private industry. Um, I don't know if you can see it on your end. We're, we're running into just a little bit of network issue on, on the tail end here. We might try and get, can we get a cable maybe uh, plugged in? I don't know if that would help. Um, we'll try and we'll try and keep going. We'll see if it um, uh, catches up. You, I, I also I think that the ACDC would have probably been you know adopted a little better, right? Would you think you get more participation if it was named that? Oh yeah. Okay. Oh, hold on. <laughs> we get somebody else to do it. Are you still there? Yep, looks like it. You're fine on my end. Is it on your end? <laughs> it's, it's possible. I think that we maybe we can keep going, and uh, we we made a little adjustment here. Um, we, we I think we got the bulk of it. It was just uh, <laughs> you said something like that. I think the most important thing is no. You're being <laughs> Not the not the piece you want to get cut off. Um, most important thing is look, we're we're building trusted partnerships with the private sector. Uh, we're the platform that was created to be the one uh, stop shop and the front door for cyber defense, right? Um, I know there's a question about like what roles and responsibilities. It's so confusing. So let me just break it down. FBI investigate, pursue. Right, they have a very specific, that's why it's the Federal Bureau of Investigation, really important mission, right? They go after bad guys, they prosecute cases, they collect evidence, we work very closely with them. Uh, NSA, they do foreign intelligence collection, right? They understand the threat environment, what's going on around the world, uh, so that we can really understand what types of capabilities and the intent of uh, countries that want to do us harm. That's very important to enabling us to defend the nation. We've been working incredibly closely with them and the FBI, particularly on this issue around the um, invasion of Ukraine. What do we do? We are the cyber defenders. We wake up every morning and we're the only ones worrying about how to defend the nation in cyber, how to defend the nation from uh, nation state attacks, and particularly right now, um, Russian malicious cyber activity against our critical infrastructure. So that's our mission, but it's not something we can do alone. We have to work with our brothers and sisters in the FBI and in the intelligence community, you know, in our Secret Service and um, U.S. Cyber Command who has offensive capabilities. But, you know, I realize it can sound confusing, right? And it certainly was confusing to me when I was in the private sector. Bottom line, we are... America's Cyber Defense Agency and JCDC is about forging that platform with the private sector. So together we can put the picture of the threat environment um, in a coherent uh, in a coherent way, so we can drive down risk to the nation. Gotcha. We got all of it that time, so that's good. <laughs> the uh, um, you, you bring up a good point, which is something I wanted to, to also ask about, um, maybe a, a little bit later, but this works out really well. Um, there's a lot going on in the world right now, and a lot of it is over in um, sort of the Eastern European area. Um, when you talk about the JCDC and the information sharing and the, 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 the critical aspect of sharing with the uh, private industry and, and so forth, uh, trust groups are, are kind of a weird thing. Like, you know, the, when it's small, like everybody kind of knows each other and they trust each other, and then when, it's, when it gets larger and larger, then people are less comfortable sharing. Um, and, and also, if it's if it's only yourself, you know, you don't have all the information. If it's you and, and the people in the JCDC, then you have you know more information. But you're still 
only getting a, a part of the picture, right? You're not getting things that like um, uh, allies across the globe are getting and so forth. So um, how do you, uh, there's no uh, clear answer, right? But like how do you sort of grapple with uh, that type of information sharing and, and how the, the dynamics work? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, it comes back to the two fundamental things. One is maintaining trust, because it's super hard to build trust, super easy to break it. Um, and two, adding value, right? We, we can't just, you know, a lot of times you get criticism from the government of, I give you information and you're a black box. I ne never get anything back from you or I get things back from you a month later. So what we're trying to do is really shift this whole concept of, you know, this buzzword of public-private partnership into what I call operational collaboration. And so what is that? That is bringing together trusted, vetted partners from industry and we sign sharing agreements because we want to make sure that we are protecting uh, everybody's information. I think that's hugely important. Um, we're bringing together those partners and we are sharing information in um, in real time, essentially, on what we're all seeing across the threat environment. And so, you know, I'm sure people in the audience use Slack. I used it in the private sector. You know, it's you would you would be surprised that Slack has actually been kind of a game changer for us because you actually have uh, private sector folks and the government in a Slack channel sharing information about. The, th the threat and what I love the most about that is that when the private sector asks the question to the government, we actually are, in, you know, we, we have this pressure on us to actually answer the question, right, which is not what you get if you send an email off to X person at, you know, government.com. Um, you know, that can sit in somebody's inbox. And so when you're actually in real time and you have the pressure of people from the private sector asking questions, it makes the government step up its game and be more responsive and be more transparent. And so I think that's hugely important, but we are very mindful to your point, Tim, of making sure that we are maintaining um, the trust of our partners. And so what we call our JCDC um, alliance partners are the biggest tech companies and so we're not going to go over that number. It's about 25 companies. Why did we pick these companies? Those are the um, internet service providers, the cloud service providers, the cybersecurity vendors, because they have the best global picture and the best global visibility into malicious cyber activity. Remember SolarWinds? That wasn't discovered by the U.S. government. It was discovered by a cybersecurity vendor. And very often, these companies are going to see malicious activity first. And so we need to understand what they're seeing. We need to enrich it with what we're seeing in the government or what we might be seeing in terms of intrusions on federal, you know, the dot .gov that we are also responsible for at CISA. And so the more that we are sharing that information and then using it to provide technical advisories, and if you all go to our webpage or um, you'll see a lot of this, that is very much enriched by what we get from our private sector partners. And so they see that they're, they are helping to add value to the larger community. They see that we're protecting information and they see that we are overall together adding value. I think that's how you maintain trust. But the groups are, you know, as I said, 25 uh, tech companies. We also work with critical infrastructure and finance and energy. And we do plan to build these out, but we're doing it in a deliberate way, again, to maintain that trust. And to your point on international partners, we work every day with, you know, as I said, we're U.S. CERT. So we work every day with the CERTs over 100 around the world because that's also very rich information on cyber defense. Um, and we work with, in particular, 16 um, most closely, and that's what's called the um, International Watch and Warning Network, the I IWWN. So since you know, we've been working with the Ukraine CERT, uh, we've been working in particular with the CERTs in Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, Czechoslovakia, Poland. Um, because they are getting a lot of uh, information on what's going on there. And then we work closely with the research community, which I think is just amazing. I love the research community, and one of my goals was to really um, ignite their awesome work to help make the whole world safer, and that's really what our coordinated vulnerability disclosure platform is all about. And why I asked Jeff Moss to bring together some amazing hackers from around the world to help advise us on how we 
continue to build trust with the community and continue to come up with unique and creative ways um, to help solve really tough technical problems. The, there's so much there. Like I, I want to double click in, in so many different places about, you know, you talk about visibility and, and we have various shared responsibility models and, and unique environments. And there's, there's sort of large service providers that have lots of visibility, but uh, other ones that are very unique and have a different type. But um, at the same time, there's, there's a few other topics that I want to get to. And I, I want to make sure to have time for uh, people to, to line up and have questions. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to, Put a pin in the the Jeff what Jeff Moss is working on, and then that part of Hacker Community. And I want to make a fairly abrupt change <laughs> here to um, um, I'm not sure what to call it. I guess a diversity and inclusion um, a couple of questions. And um, I, uh, you recently got a, an award, I think earlier, maybe or even earlier this week. Uh, physically, there was a, a Grace Hopper Award from NDU, um, not the same as the the ACM one, but uh, obviously named after uh, the same person. And um, that's correct. You you got it. And then um, uh, then what does it mean to you? And, and why is that important? Yeah. So thanks for thanks for saying that. I can't see your audience out there, so I don't know like how diverse the audience is or, or not. Um, uh, you know, as I said, I made this decision when I was probably I don't know, 13, 14, that I wanted to join the military. A lot of it was because of my dad, who's really my hero. Um, and you know, I applied early to West Point, I got in early, and um, I had never visited before, which was in retrospect kind of stupid. So I get there and I was just not prepared for what I was gonna be facing. And there were still a lot of people who didn't want women there, but it was very tough physically, very tough mentally and very tough emotionally and you know a lot of times during the first summer it's called beast barracks where you're a plebe and everybody you know the upperclassmen go out of their way to make your lives miserable i had this one guy who knew i had contact lenses and so he would haze me with a dip in his mouth so the dip would get into my contact lenses and make me you know tear up so tell me you know i was wasn't tough enough because i was crying and all that like crazy shit, right and so um it was really tough uh but you you kind of find out like who you are and how you can get through tough times and you also realize like examples of good leadership and examples of really bad leadership um and so you know i have always been um, at least early in my career, when I was in uh, the 25th Infantry Division, when I was at Fort Bragg, um, I've been one of a small number of women in, you know, a largely white male community. Now, I don't have anything against white males. I'm um, very happily married to a white male. Um, but at the end of the day, I truly believe that, you know, in my bones, that the way to solve our toughest problems is um, through diversity of thought, right? At the end of the day, that's the goal, diversity of thought. And, and how do you get diversity of thought? You bring in neurodiversity, hugely important. Diversity of gender identity. We just had trans visibility um, day on Thursday. I think every day should be um, transgender visibility day. But you, know, you bring in a, a diversity of gender identity, diversity of sexual orientation, of race, of national origin, of age, of background, right? And that's really what makes us stronger. Um, stronger as a team and better at solving problems. I just like believe that in my bones. And that's why I'm trying to create a system, a culture we are trying to build here. We have uh, 12 core principles. One of them is foster diversity, inclusion, equality, and belonging. I think belonging is incredibly important in particular um, because you can include somebody in the room, but if they don't feel like they belong there, um, then you're not creating that environment of psychological safety where people will be able to do their best. And so the Grace Hopper Award, you know, hopefully folks know who Grace Hopper is because she's awesome um she was a pioneer in computing uh was part of the team that created the first computer look it up mark one look at ENIAC, and it was just um just a, like a great uh and also super funny i mean if you really look at the history a good friend of mine wrote a whole book about her and you look you can actually look at some of her lectures where she's just 
so funny. She's a great storyteller. She's really no nonsense. She's incredibly wise. Like everybody's heard the phrase, um, you know, better to ask forgiveness than it is to ask permission. You know, that was one of her her gems, right? She's also said, uh, you know, managers. When you're a manager, you manage things. Uh, a leader manage a leader leads people. So it's like a fundamental recognition that. You know, what we need is not a bunch of managers or supervisors. We actually need leaders in our field to create those environments where people can feel empowered and, and do their best. So, you know, I was super, um, I was super excited to get that award. And also, like, she's a real person. We should read this biography if anyone's interested. It's called Grace Hopper and the Invention of the, the Information Age. I and mean, she had a lot of struggles with alcoholism. Um, she had suicidal thoughts. I'm a huge advocate for mental health because I lost my brother to suicide when he was uh, 25. And so I think um, part of what we're trying to do here at CISA is also recognize that like, you know, our business is really hard. It's really stressful. And we talk about like four hours, right? It's not, you can't sustain that. It's not good for your health, either, you know, physical or mental. And so, and a lot of my hackers here, my hunters, my incident response, my vulnerability folks are like really suffering from burnout. And so I've made a real focus on like, how do we deal with burnout? We have a whole series of this year with a guest speaker every month talking about how do you deal with burnout? One of the things we did was we made, I don't know if anybody out there does meditation, but I recommend it. So there's a bunch of apps, Headspace is one. So we just made Headspace free for all of our employees. Um, It's a mindfulness app. And so we're trying to come up with ways to help with mental health challenges because everybody has them and to really take the stigma off it and to, you know, as I always say, mental health is health. And I think if you look at a role model who struggled with things in an age where it was, you know, people looked at it in a much more stigmatized way, um, like, you know, I was in the military, people look at it in a stigmatized way for years and years, right? Now after 9-11, where a lot of veterans came back with, with PTSD, and, and there's a massive, like, high volume of suicides in the military. People are, like, finally freaking getting a clue that, like, this is not, you know, this is like having a heart murmur or having diabetes, right? These are, these are serious issues that we need to make sure people get the help that they need and they deserve. That, that was such a, that was actually such a good answer that you nailed like the next three questions I had, like already in the one. <laughs> um, but uh, um, to maybe uh, address something a little bit more specifically, you, you talked a lot about like what you're doing and what CIS is doing and a little bit about what, um, what, what industry or even society um, is uh, uh, contending with there. But um, one of the things that it's a very real problem for, for folks in our industry is hiring. And we look at the senior positions that are open and um, the, the desire to have diverse candidates. But then we have this um, dichotomy about um, folks that are unqualified because they haven't had the, the earlier opportunities. They haven't had um, you know, the training. They haven't had the, the experience. Um, and these traditionally underrepresented communities um, just haven't been afforded the opportunity. So they're, they're not ready for these senior positions. And um, so then um, it seems like you get into this, this, um, this cycle that, that's somewhat reinforcing because um, the, the underrepresented communities never kind of lift up and they're never in those hiring positions. Um, first, I guess, um, obviously, I'm a white male. Is that characterization uh, correct? Is it fair? And then if so, uh, I guess, what's next, right? How do we, what do we do now? Yeah, so, I mean, I think, I think you're right. First of all, I, I will not defend in any way government hiring, which I think is super sucky and, like, highly bureaucratic. And um, I got back from the private sector where I could hire great talent in, like, 60 days or less. Now, of course, at Morgan Stanley, we pay a bunch of money. Um, but you know, you, you, no one comes to the government to make money. Like if you, if you think you're coming to the government to make money, it's like, let me sit down and have a little conversation with you. So you come to the government because of mission, because of this incredible mission to be part of defending the nation, to raise your hand to support and defend the Constitution of the United States. That's like a privilege, frankly, and an honor. It truly is. And that's why people come 
um, to be part of this mission. And, and because critical infrastructure underpins what we do, it you know, runs our lives, it can be a life or death mission. And so we need people who are dedicated, who are serious, um, but you know, this is not uh, about making money. That said, what we've gotten recently, which I'm super psyched about, are new authorities that basically takes it off the old government lumber and bureaucracy hiring, which takes like 25 steps or whatever. Um, and this is really cool because some of my most technical folks at Morgan Stanley didn't have college degrees. They were just like rock stars, right? Because they started doing this when they were really young. And um, so what we are, this is called the Cyber Talent Management System, and it doesn't matter whether you have a degree or a CISSP or whatever, right? It matters in terms of your aptitude, which I think is most important when you're hiring entry-level folks. What is your aptitude to be good at this? So we have technical assessments, we have interviews, um, and what's your attitude? Like, I really care if you have a good aptitude to be successful in a technical field. Um, but I don't, I don't care if you're like the best technologist in the world, if you're an asshole. Like, you know, we're looking for people who are really good technically or have, have aptitude that we can train um, because you get mentored and you get to do awesome things like, you know, hunting on, on networks and doing, I mean, it's like very cool mission, right? But um, if you're a jerk, like I really, like go do something else. Because I think it's incredibly important that we are in an environment where everybody can be themselves, right? Can be their authentic selves. I know that's like, that sounds a little bit trite, but like I really believe that deep in my bones. And that's not something that I, that's, I've like come to that as I've gotten older. Because when you're a woman in a sea of men and you feel like you have to be smarter, faster, you know, a better shot, um, a better leader, like that doesn't breed being your authentic self. <laughs> and so a lot of times you're kind of like, oh, I need to be this other person to like look super tough. And so I, I just think that people perform better when they feel like they can be who they are, um, whether that is, um, you know whether whether that is um, a non-binary person or you know somebody who is uh, gay or somebody who you know comes from uh, a different background that people are not familiar with. I mean, and so I just want people to like feel like they can be who they are, and that's how you create the magic of um, an environment where people feel what I keep coming back to is sort of psychologically safe. And in order to hire diverse talent, you have to create that psychologically safe environment where people can be their authentic self, where they feel like they respect and are respected by their teammates, where they feel like they're well-led and empowered by their leadership and making a difference every day. And so what we're trying to do is like turn the whole model on its head. We are hiring a lot more people who don't have to have degrees, don't have to have certifications, but have aptitude and, and the right attitude um, to be a collaborative team player. If you look up on our website and you look at our cultural, uh, core culture principles, you know, that's really what we are trying to build. It's what we expect from each other. It's what we aspire to be. And it's really what I, what I talk about. It's like a people first culture. Um, and there are a lot of things that we're trying to do to take care of people's mental health, to welcome diversity. I mean, to give you an example, like something as simple as, there's probably a lot of folks out there that work for companies where you can put your pronouns, like not just in your signature block, but in your, in your actual email address, right? Um, like the government, it's actually really new for the government. We're like one of the very few agencies that let people put whatever they want in terms of their pronouns into their email address and it's a small it's like a small but it's a really meaningful symbol of acceptance um and so just things like that we're, we're just trying to be different and not another government bureaucracy and that's how i think we can build the diversity that will enable us to more effectively defend the nation uh, that's that's all great and i uh, I'm, I'm up here so i haven't been watching like twitter or anything but i I sure hope that uh, somebody's like live tweeting because you're like full of like awesome sound bites. Like I don't care if you have amazing technical aptitude if you're an asshole, right? Like I, I hope that I hope that people are like really streaming here. Uh, do you have a related question on this topic, Reed? Yeah. 
question right uh, related to the previous question. Okay, okay, I'll get, I'll get there in a second. So I'm glad we're, we're lining up. Um, so I'm to uh, stay there. To be comp conscious of time, I want to jump back to the um, the hacker community and, and some things you said about Jeff Moss, and then we'll come right back. Um, so in, in Q4 of last year, there was a, a push uh, by you to um, to uh, sort of lean on the hacker community to, I think you said, bolster cyber hygiene, right? So it's been uh, four or five months. Um, you, uh, CISA recently announced a, a technical advisory committee, I think is the right words, but correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, so Jeff Moss is leading it. It has um, some great people that, that I'm sure that people will recognize if you didn't see the announcement. Jan, Bcrypt. Uh, Dino Dezovi, Rachel Toback, Zardis, uh, David Weston, uh, some other folks, but like those names certainly will probably ring true to a lot of people here. Um, what's the, it's obviously very new, um, both the, the effort and uh, the committee announcement, um, but, but how is that working so far? And then how's that committee anticipated to help? Like what outcomes do you expect from that? Yeah, so I love this, right, because it's just not something that government thinks about. Like, how do you reach out to um, the hacker community and create that trust and transparency? And Jeff is part of my um, advisory board. And so I asked him, I said, look, we really want to make sure, it kind of started out this idea of igniting the hacker community. Because I, I firmly believe that, like, there are so many vulnerabilities out there that we know and or that we don't know about. And if we see bad actors get a hold of these vulnerabilities and use them, um, we, you know, we need to figure out how to create a capability to prevent that from happening to the detriment of our, the defense of the nation. And that's why I think the research community, the academic community, the, the hacker community is so important, so foundationally important to the defense of the nation. And so, but they're also a community that, like, doesn't necessarily trust the government. <laughs> so trying to figure out how to forge that trust with the government is what I asked Jeff to do, and I just said, this is the concept, and I didn't tell him, like, you know, um, who to pick or any of that, and he just went out and sort of found people who really wanted to do this, because they thought it was a great opportunity to develop and strengthen what we're trying to do, um, and to help build that, build that trust, um, and so, yeah, you mentioned Jeff, Dino, um, Isaiah Jones, um, Kurt Op Opsal, uh, Luna Sandvik. So, you know, Kurt's from Electronic Frontier um, Foundation because I want to make sure that we are also very focused on transparency uh, as well as um, protecting privacy. It's hugely important. We can't be asking people to give us information or to, sh you know, to share things with us or to work with us if they think they can't trust us because we're not going to use their information effectively, right? That's why we have the most expansive information sharing and liability protection. So we're not going to use your information and send it to the regulators. We're not going to use it and um, hold it against you. You know, we are not here to, to damage your reputation or to stab the wounded. We are literally here to help. And so I'm super excited um, about this group. And so initially, we had our initial meeting a couple weeks ago and then um, met with Jeff uh, just this week. Um, and so the whole idea is how, what are the best possible relationships that we can forge with security researchers? In particular, this is the first thing we're taking on, is to encourage um, reporting of new vulnerabilities to CISA to really allow us to um, strengthen our ability to coordinate disclosure and mitigation of vulnerabilities before they can be exploited by adversaries. And that's why some of the work we did around log for show with the research community, I, I thought was so um, helpful because we could sort of be the authoritative source because we were getting all this great information. And in a world that's really confusing because Log4j was in so many different products around the world, you'd come to one place to determine hey, am I exposed and what do I need to do to mitigate uh, the risk from this vulnerabilities? And so um, it's really, we're taking on a whole bunch of um, different problems, uh, you know, coordinated vulnerability exclusion, how do we um, effectively um, uh, embrace zero trust principles, how do we effectively ensure that um, we are embracing cloud in a secure way, um, how can we drive progress in domains like Internet of Things or mobile mobile devices? And so, but you know, if I could like 
break it down in one way. It's really a, a, such a unique community that I think represents um, the, the hardest code to crack. And that's about, again, it, it comes back to trust. You know, it's kind of ironic to me, right? We live in this, what I think makes people great leaders are being able to show vulnerability, um, create trust, show emotional intelligence, to be authentic. But like as technologists, we spend most of our time talking about zero trust, <laughs> talking about how to eradicate vulnerabilities. <laughs> like we talk about artificial intelligence, not emotional intelligence. And it's like, like you can't just be authentic. You have to be like multi-authentic, right? And so like how do you bridge this gap between how technologists uh, speak and how we need to create trust in relationships. And so um, I'm super excited about this group. It's just like, you know, it's, it's awesome. Uh, yeah, also all great, and um, you know that I'm passionate about this subject. That's how we, we met um, a few months ago. Um, but, I, you know, we went live, and we didn't record something late last night uh, on purpose. Like, I think we want to, like, engage the audience a little bit. We have a, a bit of a line, so uh, if Elizabeth could make that mic hot, and we'll just have them ask you directly. Hi, Jen. My name is Reep Gore, and I am currently a chief Oops. Is it working? I'm currently a Chief Information Security Officer at a Portland Community College. Uh, I have similar kind of experience like yours, where I'm coming from Fortune 100 to 500 companies before. And uh, I have seen that you know, coming into a male-dominated uh, career, it can be sometimes really da daunting for especially the newcomers in this industry. Um, one of the things which I realized recently is that uh, I was at a CISO dinner where there were 35 plus CISOs. Uh, I was the single person in there uh, who was a female. So uh, I think, you know, as females, sometimes we go through certain loss, which you also talked about, which can really drive that mission for us. So for us, like, you know, we are so driven that we don't really care, like, you know, although we are working on so many different initiatives like women in cybersecurity to bring, uh, to build those pipelines to uh, bring women in there. But in that CISO dinner, I felt that my male colleagues were uncomfortable with me being the single female in there. So do you have any recommendations for our male allies, how to feel comfortable as well as how can they help us in building these pipelines? Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much for the question, Lee. And you're, you, I think you're on the Women in Cybersecurity and the ISIS, uh, ISIS board, right? I am. I just got uh, onto the board of ISIS. That's awesome. Congratulations. Yeah, it's super tough, right? I mean, I think, and, and I think to your good point, um, our male colleagues are truly recognizing that they need to be part of the solution, and they really need to be allies in this space. I think. It sort of starts with a little bit of self-awareness, right? When you organize things, like I was super grateful that um, Tim asked me to to come and chat, right? Because and the a champion for diversity, and we talked about that. But I think it comes with a recognition that um, men really have an obligation to make themselves accountable for when they set up these dinners, when they put together panels, um, when they mentor. Right? How many men out in the audience mentor young women? Right? I know there are a bunch of men that specifically focus on, okay, I, I'm going to, yeah, right. But this is a difference that can really be made at the end of the day. We have a huge gap. And part of that gap in terms of the cybersecurity workforce, part of that closing that gap for the security of the nation is to ensure that we can tap into different pipelines of people. And so I, I would just ask all of our allies to feel personally accountable for helping to bring in more diverse people into our community and treat it as a mission. So, you know, one of the things I announced at WESIS at, um, at the Cleveland conference, which was awesome, also because I got to visit the uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, um, was uh, that we're going to get to 50% by 2030. So we're at 26%, 25% women in cybersecurity. 
we're at 36 percent at CISA, so we can absolutely get to 50 percent soon. But I'm talking about the the nation, right? We really need to close this gap to make sure that we have a highly diverse, highly vibrant workforce and. You know, men, um, because you dominate this field, you should feel accountable for helping to create those opportunities uh, for women. I have, I have a follow-up uh, comment to that and a question. So um, I am a member of Forte Group as well. You might have heard the name because we have been trying to bring you in for a, a firefight chat. And there are several uh, CIOs uh, as well as CISOs. Uh, you know, there are a couple of CISOs who are part of JCDC as well, who are part of that community. So are you also, I, uh, you know, I depend on that community sometimes. Like, you know, it's a close knitted community. I can, uh, you know, discuss ideas there. Do you have similar kind of community which you rely on? You know, um, not like not like that in particular. You know, throughout because I've done so many different things um, throughout my life and career. And to me, you know, I like fundamentally believe that life is a contact sport, and you can like get that get down to inbox zero, and you can like write a couple good papers, and it's like all about your relationships. The loss of my brother really reinforce this and so i have little communities from um different parts of my life you know my friends from west point my friends from oxford my team at the white house who i'm still like in a whatsapp channel on because they're still part of you know my extended family and so i've got these communities really that um uh where you can truly like open yourself up and be vulnerable and be your authentic self the aspen institute i've got great so it's like little communities around the world probably not one that's all women um to be honest but um certainly ones where i feel like is a real um trust space but you know to be honest i'm trying to create that at CISA. so hey um i'm jacob uh Thanks for doing the keynote. I want to say that first. Um, next, uh, I heard mention of uh, of Slack. And I, I know that uh, government agencies tend to get into the hacker community Slack channels and uh, reach out that way. Has it been under consideration to maybe open a CISA or a JCDC Slack or Discord channel, something that e this is a reach out to hacker community, please don't X. Um, that would be an interesting thing to see. I think that would bring in some talent just into your line of sight. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, thanks. Uh, so we, we used Slack because it was the easiest thing that we could stand up really quickly. Um, we basically, it, you guys probably know log for um, J uh, vulnerability was sort of went um, viral, you know, publicly the 10th of December. And so we stood this thing up like on the 11th of December because we really wanted to make sure that we had, we were building a picture of what was happening in the, um, across the world in the vulnerability um, space so we can try and get ahead of mitigating it. And I think we were um, actually, we haven't seen a ton of significant breaches, I'll say yet, right? Um, but I think that was a great example of how to generate a real sense of urgency and how to make sure that we're working really effectively with the research community on that. So I was, I was really proud of that effort. So we use Slack for that. Um, somebody else had reached out to me the other day about you know standing up a Discord channel. This is one of the things that I want to ask Jeff and um, his team to look at is how do we build these bridges with the hacker community, what are the tools that we can use? And so um, I love the question and I will take it back. Hello, my name is Michael Mimo. I'm a CISO for a non-critical infrastructure company. And I love the fact that you put up Shields Up. So it gives me great reference for me to help defend our infrastructure. But how else can you, what other ideas are there that CISA is gonna have for helping non-critical infrastructure companies defend themselves. Thank you, and thank you for serving. Thank you, Michael. Um, so, so a couple things on, on Shields Up, right? I think there was some criticism, and thank you for it, because I think um, from a messaging perspective, I think it's been really helpful to have that web page. If you go to sysa.gov, you see Shields Up, you click on that. It's like your one-stop shop for 
information about the threat environment, right, that the president talked about in terms of evolving intelligence, that the Russians are looking at options for cyber attacks on the homeland, which, by the way, could be against critical infrastructure, or it could be against non-critical infrastructure, because that might actually be a more vulnerable target, or it could be against a supply chain as an injection path to go after critical infrastructure, which is why on that website, we have been super clear that all businesses, large and small, should consider themselves at risk. And even though our mission is to focus on critical infrastructure, um, all of our guidance, all of our technical advisories, everything on that web page is for the entire community to include even at the personal level. Some of you will know I'm on this like um, campaign to ensure that everybody uh, implements multi-factor authentication. <laughs> you know, we need to do this across our infrastructure, but we also need to do it personally. Um, I'll come back to that story in a sec, um, Tim, because it also gets me an opportunity to talk about music, which I love. Um, but but uh, we, you know, we work with uh, stakeholders across the nation. So one of the things, Michael, and I think some of my teammates are there, but we are, uh, we have a field force of about 600 people across the country uh, that is growing in terms of our cybersecurity advisors and our cybersecurity state coordinators. Um, we have a ton of free services. In fact, one of the cool things on Shields Up that we work with our JCDC partners, um, they came up partner with us also the um, open source uh, open source community to come up with a whole bunch of free cybersecurity services and tools because we understand that there are communities out there and my friend Bo Woods and Josh Corman you know have this term about target rich resource poor and so providing pro bono services is hugely important we do a bunch of free services whether that's phishing assessments vulnerability assessments cyber hygiene um, so but if you have any any questions at all, please reach out to us. You know, I feel like as America's Cyber Defense Agency, we can't just defend critical infrastructure. We have to ensure that we have outreach across the community because in our highly connected world, really everything is vulnerable. So we really need to work together um, as a community. My name is Megan Benoit and uh, I'm a network security engineer I feel like we pay a lot of lip service to mental health and downtime and making sure people have time for, for themselves and for staying healthy. But last night at our CISO panel, we were hearing the opposite. They want people who live, breathe, and eat security and are doing research in their spare time and, and really just love us. And I mean, I, I love security. I've been doing it for 20 years. This is great. It's what I want to do. But I've got kids. I've got hobbies. I don't, I don't want to do that. And um, Honestly, I'm a bad security engineer when I don't have downtime. So how do you deal with management kind of, yeah, we care about your mental health and we want you to, you know, and then at the same time they push you to do more. How do you, how do you tell management to kind of back off and uh, respect people's space and their free time? Uh, it's a great question. I think um, at the end of the day, like, it really matters what senior leadership says and does, um, because we are sending the signal, right? I mean, if people see that um, I take time off, if people see that I talk about the suicide of my brother and how important I think it is to get help, um, if people see that we are saying we think meditation and mindfulness is important, if people are saying um, across the board, you have to take vacation. You know, if you look at our core principles at CISO, one of them is called Make It Count, which basically says, you know, taking time off, and I've got it somewhere here, taking time off is just as important as working hard, because if you don't take time off and spend time with your family and your friends, you will burn out. Trust me, I've been there. And so what I talk about with my senior leaders is to be very, very cognizant of uh, the mental health of their teams, of burnout, and, to, and we make sure we provide these resources. So I think if the senior leaders are sending that signal, making sure we're not just talking the talk, but walking the walk, um, and what I do to reinforce that, frankly, is make myself super accessible to my workforce. So I do sensing sessions with the workforce once a week for an hour. 
So like small groups, like 10 to 12 people, and they can say whatever they want. It's like a very safe space, no managers, no supervisors. I do office hours where anybody in the agency, whether you're an employee or a contractor, can sign up one-on-one, -on -one, 15 minutes, like share your idea, just get to know each other. Um, and I, people know if they send me an email, like I will get back to them. Right, because it's. I feel like it's a sacred responsibility. Even though there's five thousand people in this organization, I feel like I am responsible for setting the tone, setting the culture, and you know, mental health is really a personal thing for me, to be honest. And so I feel very devoted to making sure that my workforce really, truly does take care of their mental health and takes time off, because I know that you are not going to be good at your job, you're not going to be a good network engineer, you're not going to be a good vulnerability disclosure person, you're not going to be a good threat hunter if you're working 18 hours a day. It's just like, it's, a, it's the law of physics. Hi, uh, my name's Brad. I'm a senior associate in data analytics at FMBO. Uh, first of all, thank you so, for taking the time. Yeah, sorry, your mic isn't hot for a second. I just uh, wanted to say that um, uh, we have one more question. Thanks for, we're a little bit over. Thanks for staying late. And I wanted to remind you that you wanted to, um, you had a, a, a music reference that you wanted to get back to, uh, I think. Uh, so just a, a mental reminder for you for to come back. So you have one more question and then we'll wrap up next. Hi, my name's Brad. I'm a senior associate in data analytics at FMBO. Uh, first, thank you for taking the time to be here. Everything you had to say was really interesting. My only question is, what's the story with the shark? Um, thank you for asking, Brad. Um, so I was in the Army for almost 22 years. Um, my first assignment was the 25th Infantry Division, Schofield Barracks, Hawaii, Tropic Lightning. I don't know how many people in that room have been to Hawaii, Tim, but um, I lived up on the north shore of Hawaii, up on Pipeline Beach, right near Waimea Bay, where they have the Eddie Aikau. Uh, invitational. So if any of you see my picture on our website, I, I have this, I wear my Eddie Would Go shirt. So if you're not familiar with the um, Eddie Cow story, please uh, Google it. It's pretty awesome. Um, and so, and they do that invitation, by the way, only when the waves get to be 20 feet. And so, but where I was on Pipeline Beach, that's where MTB used to set up uh, for the surf competitions back then. This was in the 90s. But I just loved the water. I did a bunch of, you know, really bad longboard surfing, uh, scuba diving right off the right off the beach, and um, just love everything about the ocean. And so my husband saw that shark sitting on a skateboard outside an antique store like many years ago, and he bought me the shark and I just bring the shark everywhere I go. It can be very interpretive though, right? Like people, <laughs> you, can, you can interpret it how you want. Um, but that's like, that's the real story though. <laughs> Great, uh, did, did you have a, a music reference that you wanted to come back to or? Yeah, so, um, and this is something for your audience who I think can be part of the solution, right? At the end of the day, if you look at the research, if you only did one thing personally, making sure that you're implementing multi-factor authentication is incredibly important. And you know, we can all argue about, you know, SMS sex, the texts are not secure, you have to have a FIDO key and blah, blah, blah. And yes, there are more method, there are methods which are more secure than others, but um, MFA is better than no MFA. But we find with the non-technical community, when you say things like multi-factor authentication, right? It's like, you sound like a total geek and people's eyes glaze over and they think, oh, that's too hard, I can't do that. And so I was working with some friends um, that are part of our, our advisory board, George Staphakopoulos in particular, who's the, the chief security officer for Apple, who's a really great dude. And we're trying to come up with the messaging, right? Because at the end of the day, it's like, how do you make the message resonate? And so rather than talking about MFA, it's, it's really more than a password, right? That's like the tagline, more than a password, more than your login and password, whatever it is, get another factor in there, can make you research shows, Microsoft did this, like 99% less likely to get hacked. Um, so what we're trying to do, right, is to get Boston, and if there's anybody that has got connections with Boston, right, to do, because um, like more than a feeling, right, more than a feeling, you can, you can like hear it, more than a password, I can't sing, but anyway, so um, we're trying to get a little bit of like 70s, 80s rock and roll 
Um, and and so you know, I get to get to end up on that uh, on that uh, on that note. But if anybody has any contacts with Boston, reach out to me. Looks like no specific pickers, but I'll try and hunt down and, and see who, who might have the contact. Well, um, I mean, I think that this worked uh, as good as we could expect it to this morning. I, I want to thank you again for taking the time, even though uh, you weren't here and you weren't able to you know, directly interact. But we really appreciate it, and we appreciate the uh, what you're trying to get done over there. So um, thanks for joining us, and, and next year you're welcome to come for all four days. Awesome. Well, thanks to everybody. Thanks for making this work and your flexibility and really glad to spend time with you all. And again, um, love feedback. Uh, if there are any questions about partnering with us or if you see things that we put out that you think um, we can improve upon, um, please reach out. We're really um, trying to make sure that we are doing everything we can to build trusted partnerships um, and also to defend the nation. So thanks again, Tim. Thank you.